All right, it's great to be here. It's really, uh, I want to thank the organizers and such a cool opportunity to talk about cell science. Uh, I'm an assistant professor recently recruited to the University of Washington, Department of Medicine and Nephrology, which is kidney medicine. And today I'm going to talk to you about how we're going from iPS cells to organoids to study cell biology at the tissue scale. So this is a quote from Richard Feynman. He said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And as cell biologists, we take that message to heart. We're modelers. So we actually have two different ways that we can study disease and organisms and biology, the in vitro cell approach and the in vivo animal models. And both of these have advantages and disadvantages. The in vitro approach is high throughput. It can be very mechanistic. You can use human cells. But ultimately, it's much more simplistic than what's actually going on in vivo. Whereas the mouse obviously is more complex and physiological, but it's low throughput and it's not human. So there's also, you know, I was thinking at the end of grad school, is there something that we can do in the, in the middle that can bridge these two approaches? And around that same time, my uncle, pictured here, was looking for his second kidney transplant. He received his first when he was only 28 years old. He got it from this woman here, my grandmother. And she said at the time, if your child has a fever, give them chicken soup. If your child has glomerulonephritis, give them a kidney. And it turns out that actually this is not an uncommon event. In fact, one in every 10 people will actually suffer from kidney disease at some point in their lifetimes. And this got me thinking about the need to help people like my uncle, who luckily was able to receive a transplant, his second one, and is alive today to enjoy a baseball game with his family. So today's talk, I'm, I'm going to start by talking about how we're building a human cellular model of the kidney. And I'm going to talk about then how we're using CRISPR gene editing to model disease in a dish. And finally, I'll wrap up with some future directions about how we can use the technology and maybe uh, go further together. Just to remind you of what the kidney does, it performs essential functions in our body. It filters the blood, gets rid of the waste products. It also is essential for maintaining homeostasis and keeping all the good stuff back in our body, reabsorb reabsorbing it at just the right concentrations. And the way it does this is that blood enters the kidney in these microfluidic subunits called nephrons. And this is a picture of a nephron shown here. It's a pretty complex little subtissue. And blood enters through a capillary nest called the glomerulus, penetrates these filtering cells called podocytes, which keep things like red blood cells out of the nephron. And then the filtrate is processed through proximal and distal tubules just to do exactly what I said, to take back all the good stuff and to just throw away the things that the body doesn't need or doesn't recognize. Now, we can't regrow nephrons. So if we lose them, they're gone forever. And this is actually what causes chronic kidney disease, is the progressive loss of nephrons. And the therapies that we have are limited and have serious side effects. We furthermore, we don't understand how the different kidney diseases that make up the spectrum of CKD actually work at a cellular level. And as a result, we haven't developed medications that actually treat the root causes of kidney disease. Now, the approach that our lab is taking, as well as many others around the world, is to generate new human tissues from a patient's own cells. And we are taking now urine samples from patients. We can derive adult cells in those. And by introducing stem cell genes and growth signals, we can turn back the clock on these to what are called iPS cells. I think most people here are familiar with those. Now, what's new in this field is that although for many years we were able to make heart, neurons, liver, other types of tissues from iPS cells, we were never able to make kidney. But that's recently changed. So work that I did, other people did while I was a postdoc, have found that certain chemicals and growth signals can transform iPS cells and induce their differentiation into the kidney lineage. And they produce these beautiful kidney organoid structures shown here. And we can now use these organoids in vitro for disease modeling and drug discovery experiments in the lab, or potentially to transplant, to transplant back into that patient where they could be generated on demand and would be immunocompatible 100%, which is a huge advantage over what's available now. 
This is only part of a larger story that organoids have been being created recently for a variety of different body parts, such as even the brain. Uh, intestine has been around for a long time, eye, pancreas, liver. And the underlying definition for all of these things is that they are a collection of cells in vitro that resembles a body tissue or an organ, ideally both structurally and functionally. This is really a new field for cell biology. So how did we make the kidney organoid? This is our differentiation protocol. We start off with dissociated pluripotent stem cells. We sandwich them so they grow in 3D as these little spheroids. And then by treating them with a small molecule, chyr, at a high dose, we induce their differentiation first into mesenchymal cells. And following that, they undergo a, meson a, a mesenchymal to epithelial transition that you can see occur over about two weeks. And they form these little, these little structures of tubules shown here in the dish. And when you examine these, you find that there are epithelial structures labeled here in green, these tubules that are specifically labeled for proximal tubular markers. And they're adjacent to mesenchymal stem cell uh, populations. There's a, not, not MSCs, but this, it's, a, it's a nephron progenitor stem cell that is a mesenchymal cell. And those are known to differentiate into the kidney during development. So we can now compare these structures an organoid here on the right compared to this uh, human kidney tissue on the left. And what's remarkable is that in both cases, you have these green proximal tubular cells that are closely opposed to these red aggregates of filtering cells called podocytes. And this is a relatively large structure. These are about the same scale. This organoid here is about a millimeter in diameter. When we compare it, to the human kidney, we can see the kidney has the same types of cells in very close juxtaposition. And uh, these cells are also, for, these are actually forming more complex structures, but the overall, the overall architecture of these structures is conserved in the organoid and the organ. Now, obviously, this has a long way to go before it's a functional tissue like the kidney, but it's still somewhat remarkable to think that this structure here was once a skin cell. When we look at a closer view of the structures in the organoids, we find that they have an architecture that resembles the nephron. So we have these podocyte cells, which are the filtering component. These lead directly into proximal tubular epithelial cells and then to distal tubular cells. And we can separate these by specific markers and know that they're forming these, these organized segments. There are also endothelial cells here shown with CD31 that are arising naturally in these cultures and glom onto the organoids. This isn't a rare event, but rather a very common one. In fact, about 80% of the proximal tubular containing organoids also have endothelial cells and podocytes that are arising within them. So it's really trying to make a nephron. And uh, a very exciting development recently is that they've transplanted, and our lab is doing this as well, transplanting these organoids into mouse kidneys to see whether they can actually provide functional benefit. They haven't really shown that that's possible yet. But what has been done is to, is to see that these can actually form very organized structures in the mouse kidney that, are relevant, re, that very closely resemble the structure of a human glomerulus and a human nephron in vivo. So this is an image of one of these structures. The podocytes here are labeled uh, with the red nuclei and the green cell membrane. And you can see that it's actually forming this capsule-like structure known as the Bowman's capsule that's present in, vi in vivo and collects the filtrate from the blood through the podocytes and drains it into the nephrons. So this gives us some excitement that in the very long term, we may be able to actually use these stem cells to produce functional kidneys that will actually provide benefit to patients. Now in the shorter term, we're interested in using this to model disease. So now I'm going to tell you about how we're doing that. And the focus is going to be on this disease, polycystic kidney disease. And the characteristic feature of PKD is that epithelial cysts and fibrosis arise within solid organs and disrupt the organ function. And you can see an example of this here. This kidney has just become massively enlarged, scarred over, and has many of these large sacs inside it. This is an extremely common disease. 
affects one in every 600 people on the planet. There's no cure. And it runs in families. So for example, this is actually a branch of my family. And uh, you can see uh, all of these people, starting with the founder here, are now at risk for PKD. We know that these, this disease is caused by mutations in two proteins, polycystin-1 and polycystin-2. These form a complex at the primary cilium, which is an uh, antenna-like organelle that sticks into the lumen of tubules. But we don't understand what the protein complex does, and we don't understand why mutations lead to fluid accumulation and cystogenesis. And we really need human laboratory models to study this process. So to do this, we introduced mutations into either of these genes using the CRISPR-Cas9 system, either PKD1 or PKD2, and the results are shown here by Westernblatt. We've knocked out specifically the mature form of PC1 or uh, essentially any protein of PC2, and uh, this is quantified here. So what happens when you make kidney organoids from our PKD pluripotent stem cells? So these are our most recent results shown on this slide. This is a, a six-well dish, so it's 35 millimeters in diameter. These are the non-PKD organoids on the left, and these are our gene-edited PKD knockout organoids on the right. As you can see, these organoids over several months now have grown to a, a, a very gigantic size at least relative to cell biologists. And uh, when we quantify this, we actually see that the control organoids very rarely give rise to these fluid-filled structures, these cysts, whereas both our PKD1 and our PKD2 knockout lines do give rise to these structures. And when we, when we take a look at these with the microscope, we can see that they are LTL positive, meaning they're derived from proximal tubular epithelial cells. And furthermore, these cysts are comprised of these epithelial cells with tight junctions and primary cilia, which as I introduced before, is the site of action for these proteins. So this is very exciting. We've now been able not only to reconstitute organoids, but actually reconstitute disease. If we now take a look at the proliferation in these structures and zoom in, we can see that in this cyst, for example, there are many dividing cells, and this is actually stronger in the PKD lines and cysts versus the wild-type tubules. So I just want to end by talking about where we're going with this. The first thing is something that I think we can do with the Allen Institute in a really cool way, and that's to really visualize this process of cyst formation and organoid differentiation in vitro and understand its basis at the cellular level. So if you watch this, this is the mesenchyme undergoing the MET into the tubular organoids. And we can now watch these, these, these tissues form. We can see this is a PKD organoid, and it's forming one of these little bubbles that's later on going to expand to be a gigantic cyst. And wouldn't it be cool to do that with some live markers and organelles? The other thing we're interested in doing is adopting this for high throughput technology so that we can now scan perhaps hundreds of thousands of compounds in organoids to see which ones affect differentiation, which ones affect disease. And this is an example of our 384 well plate here where we're zooming in and you can see in each of the little tiny wells it's peppered with many of these little kidney organoids with a distal tubule, a proximal tubule, and podocytes all in the right arrangement. So this gives us an ability to perform clinical trials potentially in vitro to find drugs that are going to work. So to conclude, I've shown you today that human pluripotent stem cells can produce kidney organoids with complex nephron-like structures the first time we're able to grow these types of tissues. We've shown that gene-edited kidney organoids with mutations in PKD genes form massive proliferating cysts from the kidney tubules, also the first time that's been reconstituted in a dish. And I think in the long term, the ability to recreate human developmental processes and disease is going to help us understand at the cellular level what's happening in these and how we could potentially intervene and control them to the benefit of humanity. So with that, I'll thank just the, all the people at the UW who have been really uh, tremendously influential and helpful, and particularly the, per the people in my laboratory uh, and the funding agencies that have supported the work and uh, you for your attention. Great. We have time for a couple of questions. Do 
you know if the cysts arise because of a uh, transport defect, uh, osmotic effect, or more sort of morphogenesis cell rearrangements? It's a really great question. Nobody knows the answer for sure. I can tell you that one of the, that this polycystin complex, a key element of it is a channel. And that channel is known to transport or is believed to transport cations, possibly in a non-selective way. So if you think about the gating of that channel and possibly an effect on transport and osmotic gradients, that could likely be a mechanism. So in your control line, if you, so if you do the, just do the knockdown of K PKD1 or 2, also can uh, show the similar phenotype? Well, in the control line, this is what we started with for our um, gene editing experiments. So we know that if you knock out the genes, you get this effect. We don't know if you knock it down whether you'll get it. And it's actually been difficult for us, at least, to do siRNA type of approaches in vitro with organoids because the, the cultures are very dense and uh, many times they've stopped dividing. So we're still working on trying to do knockdown approaches to complement this. It's a really interesting talk. I, I recall from the PKD um, literature, there's a, it's kind of like this three hit model that there's the third hit, you not just into two hits, lots of heterozygosity, but also in an environmental insult. So it seems like your system could be just really ideally suited to start of engage with, you know, what is that third hit um, in culture? Yeah, I mean, uh, we were surprised that we even get a phenotype uh, in this very simple system. And, and, and there must be some third hits already in there. But it doesn't happen in every organoid. And we found that different culture conditions can promote or inhibit cystogenesis. So yeah, that might be a way of understanding, of interrogating or pipetting things in and seeing, OK, what can induce or what can limit cyst formation. Okay. Thank Let's you. Thank Benjamin again.